Imagine, if you will, a podcast. A podcast beyond that which is known to man. It exists in both fandom and discovery, in viewing and critiquing. My name is Matt Hurt. This is Anthology. Hello and welcome to Anthology, presented by ObsessiveViewer.com. If this is your first time listening, Anthology is a podcast exploring science fiction anthology storytelling during television's first golden age, beginning with The Twilight Zone. Each podcast, I share my thoughts on an episode of this iconic series as a first-time viewer, as well as share some trivia about the episode. I then end each podcast with a bonus review of a movie or show related to the week's episode. You can find more of Anthology at AnthologyPod.com. And if you want to contact me, you can like the Facebook page at Facebook.com slash AnthologyPod. Tweet me at ObsessiveViewer. Send an email to Matt at ObsessiveViewer.com. Or call and leave me a voicemail at 317-762-6099. If you like what you hear and you want to support the podcast, the easiest way to do that is to head over to iTunes and leave a rating and review. The more ratings and reviews I get, the easier it will be for people to find the show in iTunes' search results. Um, And finally, if you want to support Anthology with your wallet, there's a donate button on AnthologyPod.com and a link in the show notes of this episode. The show notes of this episode, by the way, can be found at AnthologyPod.com slash 030. Every donation made using the donate button goes directly toward the fees to keep the podcast running and is incredibly appreciated. Today on the podcast, I'll be discussing The Mighty Casey. (laughs) It's the 35th and penultimate episode of The Twilight Zone's first season, and it aired on June 17th, 1960. And for this week's bonus review, I'll share my thoughts on The Comedian, Rod Serling's Emmy-winning Playhouse 90 teleplay. Um, But before I get started on all that, what I'll do is, as usual, read a uh, plot summary for the episode from The Twilight Zone Companion. And just so you know, going forward... um, I'm going to be spoiling the entire episode of The Twilight Zone. So make sure that you've seen the episode before continuing on in this podcast. In order to test the skills of Casey, a human-looking robot he has invented, Dr. Stillman arranges with Mouth McGarry, manager of the broken-down Hoboken Zephyrs, to have him signed up as the team's star pitcher. The Zephyrs zoom to fourth place thanks to Casey's ability to pitch shutouts, but when he's beamed by a ball... A doctor discovers the pitcher has no heart. The rules of baseball clearly state that nine men make up a team, and without a heart, Casey is not a man. The baseball commissioner rules that unless Casey is given a heart, he will not be allowed to play. Dr. Stillman happily complies, but the now compassionate Casey has too much heart, literally, to strike out the other team's players. The Zephyrs lose the pennant, and Casey is washed up as far as baseball is concerned. As a memento... Stillman gives McGarry Casey's blueprints. Looking at them, McGarry gets a sudden inspiration. Shouting Stillman's name, he chases after him. Starring in The Mighty Casey as Mouth McGarry is Jack Warden. This is his second of two Twilight Zones. Previously, we saw him in uh, Season 1's The Lonely, which somewhat ironically deals with some similar themes as this episode. Um, he, and he was also in, uh, Serling's Nightmare at Ground Zero episode of Playhouse 90 that I reviewed in episode 14 of this podcast. And since this is his last, um, Twilight Zone, I just want to point out a few other credits that he had with Serling. Um, he was in an episode of Studio One in Hollywood titled UFO that, uh, Serling wrote. He was also in, um... He actually also starred in a TV movie called The Challenge in 1955 that was co-written by uh, Rod Serling along with uh, Reginald Rose and directed by Sidney Lumet. The plot description for The Challenge is as follows. A school bus driver is fired by the local school board when he refuses to sign a loyalty oath. And then it says, this was a pilot for a proposed anthology series that didn't sell. So that's kind of interesting. And I think you can find the entire the entirety of it on YouTube um, if you just search for The Challenge 1955. Um, and then finally, Jack Warden appeared in um, Noon on Doomsday in 1956, which was an episode of United States Steel Hour that was written by Rod Serling. 
Co-starring in this episode is Dr. Stillman, is Abraham Zofair. Um, this is his only episode of The Twilight Zone, and he would go on to be in one episode of The Outer Limits in 1964. That episode's titled Demon with a Glass Hand. And rounding out the cast as Casey is Robert Sorrells. Uh, this was his only Twilight Zone episode. He was in one episode of The Outer Limits in 1964, titled I, Robot. And he also appeared in Fletch in 1985. And writer for this episode is Rod Serling, and this was based on one of his plays from before The Twilight Zone was created, and the title, The Mighty Casey, is based upon the uh, title of the famous baseball poem, uh, Casey at the Bat. And director for this episode is Alvin Ganser and Robert Parrish. Um, originally, Alvin Ganser was the director, but for reasons that I'll get into in the trivia section of the review, this episode required some reshoots that Alvin Ganser was not um, available for. So Robert Parrish was brought in to complete the shooting. So that's why both directors are credited um, on the, on the final episode. And I'm going to assume that this is the only time that multiple directors are credited in a twilight zone episode. I could be completely wrong as is the, case with this podcast i'm going through the twilight zone for the first time so i could be wrong who knows we'll find out though so before before getting into the episode and getting into my review before approaching this episode i didn't know much much about the episode itself i just knew the title and i knew that it had something to do with baseball and i thought that maybe it had something to do with a washed up baseball player, something like uh, the character of Lefty from the episode What You Need. Um, I was thinking it would be something like that. That seems to be kind of the uh, a uh, storyline that Serling likes to play with, you know, someone who is past his prime or someone who is not um, at the top of their game and kind of finding their second chance to achieve something. And that's what I kind of went, in, went into this episode expecting or thinking that it was going to be about. And so let's go ahead and go right into my review of the episode. So the Mighty Casey starts out kind of interesting in kind of an interesting way compared to other episodes of the Twilight Zone so far. Um, we just get a, a shot of a desolate baseball stadium and Serling's narration refers to it as as a ghost that was once alive but is now now deceased. And he talks a little bit about the Hoboken Zephyrs and how they used to be a major league a major league club and that they were in the National League. And then it's all kind of set up. And Serling in this part in this narration is setting the stage by showing us the modern day, and then he takes us back in time and he says. He says, we're back in time now when the Hoboken Zephyrs were still a part of the National League and this mausoleum of memories was an honest to Pete stadium, which I thought that was really interesting. Um, just we ha we've had episodes that are time travel episodes or um, period episodes. I'm thinking of like Mr. Denton on Doomsday or Walking Distance. Episodes where time or the setting is is specific to a certain time. But we haven't had a situation where Serling explains to us that we're going back in time as the audience or that we're or that we're looking at something from the past. We like in execution, we would have um, we would be introduced to uh, the main character of that episode with with a simple, hey, we're looking at a necktie party um, or we're in Mr. Denton on Doomsday. We're just introduced to the townspeople and, and Denton. It's it's never a case where we see 1960 and then brought back to the time period depicted. I thought that was kind of an interesting way to bring us into this episode. And it kind of plays to the history of baseball and how baseball is kind of this celebrated pastime or the as a sport it's America's pastime and it's a, it's celebrated for its rich history and how deep it goes in American culture in terms of history. And then he ends his uh, narration by saying that we're going to be introduced to a most unusual fellow, a left-handed pitcher named Casey. And that just the fact that he's a left-handed pitcher made me think of lefty. But again, that was kind of misdirection on my part. Um, 
So right out of the gate, we're shown we're shown that the Zephyrs are complete losers. <laughs> um, they're really they're ranked low. They can't win a game, and uh, in in McGarry's conversation with with um, I I don't know who it was a, a commissioner or another manager I don't know who it was I don't remember. He's they're talking and they say that if the Zephyrs win one game we got to call it a streak and. McGarry go he says that um their pitcher has pitched one inning and only let six runs in um and then he says that that makes him our most valuable player of the month so the script is going is going pretty far to really sell how terrible this team is and i appreciated that that we were delivered that in dialogue mostly because to show them kind of bumbling around on on the field and showing them like in practice not being able to play effectively. That would have been a little bit over the top and a little silly in an episode that will become silly and comedic. But I like that it's, it's more economical that we are told, Hey, these, these, this team is terrible. (laughs) These players aren't anything to write home about. Let's bring in this robot to, to switch things up. So I appreciated that even though usually I'm more of a show don't tell guy, I appreciated the, economy of this of the writing in this scene and um how straight to the point it was even if they are kind of hitting us over the head with how bad (laughs) how bad the team is it was still pretty effective at at setting up the 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 setup of of why they need casey and i've got to say and and i'll probably talk more about this in a bit but um jack warden's performance in this episode is really is really the standout for me he he's really good at playing the kind of frenzied or um sort of tough as nails, but tired and fatigued, um, baseball manager. He's, he's got that persona down really well. And I'll, I'll circle back to his performance later, but I just really think that that was kind of the hook going into it at this point in the episode. That, that's what kind of held my interest was his performance and his, the way that he delivered his lines. So then we're introduced to Dr. Stillman and then Casey and, Something is clearly up from from the start. Um, Stillman is kind of not necessarily cryptic. It's not it's not written as a cryptic thing. It's more of a more of an aloof characterization of Stillman. And then we have Casey, who's just really uh, robotic. Um, the first time we see him, he walks into the dugout, and then the baseball hits him right on the head, and Casey just stands there completely blank. So we know something's up with him. And then he shakes McGarry's hand. And I just, I know that this is not probably not what was intended, maybe, but this was the only connection I can make. But there's something so weird about Jack Warden's acting when Casey shakes his hand. Like, it looks weirdly orgasmic rather than him feeling pain at the at the hardness of the of the handshake. It's just a really weird over the top performance and i think that it was probably more more due to the fact that it was supposed to be a a comedic episode so they kind of went for it but i don't know it just it looks more orgasmic than anything and it's it's really bizarre (laughs) um so then we get a little bit of backstory about casey and and stillman talks about him he says that he's his creator and um, that Casey's only been in existence for three weeks. And at that point I was thinking, okay, well he's either an Android or he's been genetically engineered in some way. Um, but then we soon find out that, uh, Casey is a robot. And that made me wonder what, what's the angle? What's, what's Stillman's purpose in this episode? And I was kind of hoping for more, (laughs) um, a lot more than what we got. We get, we get the idea of why he is, uh, why he chose the Zephyrs and why Casey exists a little bit, but I just kind of wish that there was more to it. Um, but I'll get to that in a moment. But at this point, when, when it's revealed that Casey's a robot, obviously that, that, uh, took my guess that the episode would be about a washed up player with a comeback that just went way out the window. And, to be honest, I kind of wish that that's what the episode was about, though. I And I know that we've gotten episodes like that, like um, The Big Tall Wish is about kind of a, well, not necessarily washed up boxer, but kind of a, you know, an aged, gruff boxer or athlete. 
Um, so, I mean, I guess it would have been a little bit repetitive to have that, but the episode we got, the story we got, just didn't connect with me. And I kind of wish that it would have in some significant way. Because while I'm not like a big sports fan and I'm not a big baseball fan, I do feel like baseball would be my sport if I was into sports instead of movies and TV and podcasts and stuff. Um, it, I just have this, I have like a little bit of a nostalgic connection to baseball. And I kind of wish that baseball in the twilight zone would have had a stronger episode tied to it. I don't know if that's, I don't know if Serling and company returned to baseball at any point in, in the rest of the episode or the, of the series is run, but I got to say, overall, I was pretty disappointed with this one. And that disappointment continues a little bit um, to an extent because when Casey is pitching and obviously we don't see it because um, it's kind of a minimalist take on it. We see we hear sound effects as he pitches and then um, we <laughs> we see the catcher moving around to try to try to get the ball when he's when he's doing the curveball. Um, it's all silly, but th- the sound effects, I, I appreciated the, the fastball sound effect because it sounds like they use the sound of a fighter plane or um, some kind of plane engine sound. And I, I liked that. But then then there's this goofy like slide whistle sound for the curveball and the slow ball. And it, I don't know, it just feels weird and out of place. And it's the episode overall is silly, so it fits the tone. I'm uh, Maybe it's not that out of place because it does fit the tone that they're going for. And I like silliness and I think the silliness is fine itself. But I think I like when the Twilight Zone is more serious. Um, that's not to say that I don't like not serious Twilight Zone episodes. <laughs> but I think that you can have a silly episode but still have some substance to it. And I don't feel like this episode has that much substance. This is a very lighthearted episode but when it comes to the characters, there isn't much to them. Like Mouth McGarry, he is a great performance by Jack Warden, but I wish that his arc had more substance to it. I wish that there was a little bit more dimension to the character in that I, I kind of wish that he would have been more of a on-his-last-leg baseball manager um, or maybe he had some kind of stake in, in bringing on a pitcher that could that could – raise the Zephyr's profile a little bit. And I kind of wish that it would have been a little bit more, more to it than, than what we got. What we got is just mouth McGarry is this, um, outspoken manager in this silly comedic episode, which is fine. It could work for some people. It just didn't work for me because I wish that there was a little bit more to it and a little bit more to the character. And I found myself really wishing that there would be more, or wondering if there was more to the story going forward. Like after the scene where there were introduced to Casey as a pitcher, uh, before the montage of, of them winning several games. Um, after that, I, I kind of started wondering like, is this going to be an episode about humanity in artificial intelligence? Is this going to be about the robot robots desire to play baseball or desire not to play baseball? And I was kind of thinking that would be an interesting angle, but it never materialized, obviously. Um, I did I did think a, a, some of the comedy did did hit me in a good way. Um, there was a when when McGarry is talking to Dr. Stillman and he tells him that we're not going to they're not going to use the word R O B B O T T. I thought that was cute. Like you can't spell robot. It's it's funny. Um, and then probably, probably the biggest laugh I got was when he's on the phone with the, what I assume is the commissioner or, or someone. And like, it's established that, that he, they have a bit of a rift or, or they're not, you know, they're not on f- that friendly of terms. Um, and, and McGarry says to him, I want you to shake hands with her, with your new ace pitcher while he's staring at his hand and kind of favoring it a little bit after the pain of, of it. I, I liked, I liked that. I thought it was funny and I like Jack Warden in, in 
that role a lot. Um, and he kind of he kind of saves it for me. I talked a little bit about how much I liked his performance a little bit ago, but just to reiterate, he's he's a very charismatic actor, and the way that he portrays McGarry in this episode, it's exactly what I would expect from like a classic Major League Baseball manager character. He's definitely um, he's got that type of personality that I would that I would expect from this type of character. And you could probably construe that as being, uh, as saying, well, he's being kind of an archetype. He's being kind of maybe a little stereotypical to an extent, but it works here. Cause this is a silly episode. And sometimes that could, you know, that could probably, um, mean that it's needed. It needs to be kind of stereotypical, but it's not because it it's not detrimental to the episode for me because Jack Warden is just very charismatic in it. And something that I noticed was that they were they there's of the probably half dozen times that they use the word robot, they say robot. They don't say robot like they did in the Lonely or I think I think another episode. I can't think off the top of my head. Um, they say robot instead of robot. But the doctor, I believe, says robot. Um, so we've got it that we've got it there. We've met our robot quo- quota, I guess. And then around this time is when we get the scene where 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 McGarry asks Stillman what what's in this for him. Um, Casey's been playing some games. He's he's been really he's been winning games for the Zephyrs, um, having repeat shutouts over and over again. He's doing a fantastic job. So at this point, McGarry asks Stillman, he says, what's in this for you, Doc? And this is a point where I, <laughs> again, I really wish that there was more to it than what we got. Um, his response is, it's just scientific. And he says that Casey is a kind of Superman. And he <laughs> in another piece of uh, comedy, he says that he's letting he's letting Casey pitch for the Zephyrs because they are the worst. Um, it's kind of an experiment for him or it's, it's data mining. Um, he wanted to pick the worst team and he found the Zephyrs and that's the reason why he's doing what he's doing. And a lot like with McGarry, I wish that there was more to Dr. Stillman's character and more to his motivation. I mean, if they aren't going to develop McGarry's character, I wish there was at least something in the way of like the troubles of the scientists who created Casey, the, like the moral implications of it or something about ethics of creating this, this robot for, for purposes of, of playing uh, baseball. I don't know. I just, I just wish that there was something of substance there because right now it's all comedy and, and it's not much substance to it. And I mean, like I said, a lot of the comedy is kind of landing with me. I'm enjoying the comedy to an extent, um, but that's mostly because it's coming out of charismatic actors and, uh, whippy dialogue, but there's just not much that's going to make me want to come back to this episode. Um, and that's a shame because like I said, I like the baseball setting quite a bit. And then we get the kind of closest thing to dramatic, um, tension or dramatic, or drama in general, really a dramatic turn in this episode in that Casey's hit by a ball during a game. And in that moment, I thought of it doing three things. Um, I thought of, I thought it could be mean that it was ending his career and that he would, um, that the Zephyrs would need to play without him or that it would change his programming to where he would become a different type of robot or that it would reveal his secret to everyone. And those were kind of the avenues that I feel like it could have gone. It gone, it went down a couple of them a little bit. Um, well, really it only went down to revealing his secret and uh, we get the scene with him in the hospital and the doctor examining him saying that he's okay. He was surprised because, you know, he took a really bad hit, but you know, he's okay. And then he realizes that Casey has no pulse or heartbeat And at that point, I was just, I didn't check out. I didn't check out of the episode, but it made me think, like in my notes I wrote down, I'm not very interested in the story overall. 
because like I said, nothing about it is engaging to me. Um, the things that are being set up or the things that I'm interpreting as set up for d- a deeper story do not, do not, uh, uh, go down the way that I want them to. They don't, um, they don't go down those deeper story avenues. And I think that that's just a really big missed opportunity. And yes, it was the commissioner who said robot in this scene, um, that we're at now. And this is probably the strongest scene of the episode for me is that the commissioner is talking about Casey, the robot. Um, it's, it turns into a bit of a debate over whether Casey is a robot or a human or it's, it's what his motivations are, I guess. Um, overall, it's kind of weak. And I think at this point, I was just trying to latch on to something, some narrative, uh, thing that, that would make me more hooked in the story. And what I came back to was that this seemed to be a debate over Casey's status as a human being or a robot. And, it was just kind of a weak connection. And ironically, the lonely also starring Jack Warden earlier this season did it much better. And with a little bit more brevity too, because with, um, James A. Corey and Alicia in the lonely, we don't get them together that much. Like we're introduced to Casey much earlier than when we're introduced to Alicia in terms of the, uh, timing of the episodes. And it's just a lot more impactful in The Lonely. Granted, that is a more personal story, a more um, human story, and a more character-driven story, whereas The Mighty Casey is more of a comedic story, and it's all for comic effect. But again, and I keep reiterating this, I keep repeating it, and I'm sorry for the repetition, but there's just not much of substance in this episode. And that was kind of the running theme of my viewing of this episode, both viewings of this episode that I did. Um in that I wish that there was more to it and more substance and more nuance to the characters. <laughs> and so then we get to kind of um, the apex silliness of this episode. Uh, they reach an agreement with the commissioner and the doctor and, and everyone involved. They reach, agree- reach, they reach an agreement in, where, in which Dr. Stillman will give Casey a heart to make him classify as a human being so that he can continue to play baseball. It's an absurd turn, but kind of interesting to an extent. And it made me really curious what effect it would have on Casey. And it was just, it was okay. This I thought was pretty funny and I don't think it was an intentional, but it's funny how they're all in the room. They're all debating about uh, Casey needing a heart in order to play baseball and they're debating over, over whether he's human or, or what have you, um, or an, or a robot. But they're doing all of this while Casey is laying in the hospital bed. And I thought, it's kind of absurd. It's kind of silly because he's not injured. He's okay. He doesn't need to be in the bed at all. It just seemed more like a a situation that just needed someone in the bed. I, I don't know. I thought that it was kind of funny to look back at it and realize there is no reason for him to be in the hospital bed as if he is injured or sick because he's neither. So we're kind of closing in toward the ending of this uh, episode and we get that the doctor, Dr. Stillman is, is operating on Casey and they're in McGarry and the team, they're in the locker room of the, of the stadium and the whole team is there and they're on the phone checking on the status of Casey. And this is where I was, I was kind of unclear about this. It seemed like the manager, like McGarry, um, it seemed like McGarry was using Casey's operation as a motivational tool and using it as something to, um, really bring out, the team's morale or bring up the morale or give them something to play for. And it made me think that they thought that he was dying. And it kind of made me wonder if, um, his teammates knew if he was a robot or not. And I didn't think it was that clear in the episode. Um, because it kind of made me think that McGarry was making them think that he's dying in order to motivate them to play, which is something that I would have liked to see, (laughs) And I think it would have been more interesting to see the episode take that turn rather than have Casey come back. 
Although what we did get was pretty pretty enjoyable for me, so I could either take or leave either version of it. But I kind of think, again, this was somewhat of a missed opportunity or something that was not very clearly defined or um, well realized because McGarry is giving this pep talk, and at that point I think it's kind of funny, but it's also not not clear whether or not he's just telling them to uh, you know, build them up. Uh, in order to like, if he's making them think that he's that Casey's dying in order to motivate them, it's not clear. And it's not a really clear through line either. It's something that's hinted at. And then once Casey arrives, it's kind of dropped. And that's, that's a shame because I think that that would have been an interesting angle. So when Casey gets back, he's clearly a lot more lively and he's smiling and he's emoting and he's speaking clearly. And he says that he feels like togetherness, and that made me wonder what was going to happen in the game. Like it made me genuinely curious what was going to happen, even though I wasn't as, as emotionally invested in the story or as, or very engaged by it either. I was very curious how this was going to alter his, his pitching ability. (laughs) And, uh, then we get this nice montage where it's, (laughs) where he's just letting, like letting runs go, letting, um, uh, them, score on them several times by the end of it we get um that they're down the zephyrs are down 14 to nothing in the first inning and i thought that was really funny um, to see and then we get the reveal that it's because casey now has compassion because he has a heart that he doesn't have the heart to disappoint the batters. So that's why he's letting them score because it's making them happy. And I think that that was, that was silly, but I enjoyed it. I thought that that was a, that was a nice, um, ending to that or a nice reveal for that character, I guess, or a next, a nice turn for the character of Casey. Um, and he has the line that says, uh, Dr. Stillman thinks I should go into social work, which I thought was kind of, uh, kind of funny, I guess, or kind of fitting, but, Overall, it just, it still made me remember, like, it it wasn't enough to really make me enjoy the episode as much as I wish I would have. And so Casey's days of playing baseball are are done. He, with the heart, he can't, uh, he doesn't know enough about humans or he doesn't know enough about being a human in order to compete with humans. And there's a little bit of dialogue about that and about how he has too much compassion. He doesn't know competitiveness and all that stuff. And I mean, it's, it's fine. It's, it's fine, but just kind of a little, uh, too little, too late in the episode to really have a, an effect on the narrative or on the theme of the episode. And so the parting gift for McGarry from Dr. Stillman is that he leaves him the blueprints for, the robots and it's implied through the closing narration that um, the manager took his talents and his team to the West coast and created a team of pitchers and, and they went on to win a bunch. And I don't know, at the end of the day, it's just not, it wasn't my cup of tea. It was not, it was not a good episode for me. It was, um, you know, I, I think that I would, I, I think that Jack Warden's performance um, elevates this episode a little bit more than what, say, Mr. Beavis did, um, a couple weeks ago. Because Mr. Beavis didn't really do much for me either, but this episode at least had Jack Warden's strong performance. So I think I'm, I would probably rank this a little bit higher than, uh, Mr. Beavis, but it, it really wasn't for me. It was not, it was not that great of an episode for me. And as far as trivia is concerned, we've got some interesting stuff here. Um, so Paul Douglas was originally going to be playing, uh, McGarry. So, so there's a whole story that Paul Douglas had a drinking habit and Rod Serling was reluctant to, um, to cast Paul, Paul Douglas in the role of McGarry because he was afraid that he would be drunk the whole time. So what happened was they filmed the episode with Paul Douglas throughout, throughout the episode, it was clear or throughout the filming, it was clear that Paul Douglas was, uh, what they, what they thought of was that what they thought was that he was drunk the whole time. So Rod Serling actually called his agent or his manager, um, and complained about it and saying that it was very unethical of them to hire, to, to let, uh, the twilight zone hire Paul Douglas under the pretense that he wasn't drinking because he's clearly drunk. 
so what happened was he wasn't drunk. He was actually uh, had a coronary related death about two or three days after the episode was completed. And what had happened was he hadn't been drinking, but he had been suffering from such poor health that he was deteriorating. He was dying while they were filming it essentially. So because the episode was supposed to be a comedy, Rod Serling and also because of, you know, moral reasons, obviously Rod Serling was reluctant to, you know, to release the episode or to let it be broadcast the way it was because it was showing Paul Douglas essentially dying throughout filming. And so there was a whole thing with CBS refusing to pay for the episode to be reshot. So Serling actually uh, paid $27,000 to have it reshot with Jack Warden in in the role of McGarry um, and to have uh, some, some of the scenes redone with Warden in place of Paul Douglas. And it's that that's why we get two directors because Alvin Ganser couldn't come back. So Robert Parrish, uh, came, came aboard and reshot the scenes with Jack Warden. And I think that's really interesting. And it speaks a lot to Rod Sarling as, as a person. Um, because I mean, he fronted his own money to get, to get the, uh, the reshoot done. And the alternative was that CBS was going to have to just eat the film um, and eat the losses of, of uh, losing this episode because they weren't going to, Rod certainly wasn't going to let it be broadcast with uh, Paul Douglas's scenes. And as a weird, morbid kind of thing, I kind of wonder if there, the footage of Paul Douglas is available anywhere because I, not that I would want to see it, but it would kind of be interesting. I would assume that it's not available anywhere because um, I would assume that they didn't really archive that too much when when they uh, uh, when they reshot it with with Jack Warden. But I don't know something about it. It still makes me curious if if it's available anywhere. Okay, yeah. As far as I can tell, it is the footage is not available. I'm sure that it's it was never saved or it was never archived, but. Uh, it would be kind of morbidly interesting to to see um, what it was like. So this episode was filmed at Wrigley Field in Los Angeles, home of the minor league Los Angeles Angels at the time. Uh, Wrigley Field was a frequent location for baseball movies and programs, including Home Run Derby in 1960. And uh, there's ivy on the outfield walls that are similar to its namesake stadium in Chicago. And the Zephyr's uniforms have a National League 75th anniversary patch on the left sleeve, which would have placed the setting of the story back in 1951, which it's not its not clearly mentioned what year it is, but that's a pretty good indicator of when it could be. And let's see, Serling's ending narration was a little more prophetic than uh, he intended. Um, in it, he says, there's a rumor that a manager named McGarry took, uh, took them to the West Coast and wound up with several pennants and a couple of world championships. This team had a pitching staff that made history. And uh, so the Brooklyn Dodgers had moved to Los Angeles the year before um, this episode by team owner Walter O'Malley. But in the following season, Sandy Koufax emerged as a future hall of famer winning 130 games over the next six seasons with an ERA of 2.25. Um, his teammate Don Drizzle won, uh, 111 games with an ERA of 2.92. And, uh, the Dodgers won three pennants in those six years and two world series. So that's kind of interesting. Um, again, a lot of, I mean, I understand baseball to an extent, but, uh, this is, this is a podcast about the twilight zone. So that's, that's interesting enough. So in closing the mighty Casey, it, and this is going to be harsh, but I think it's kind of funny that the episode revolves around a character gaining a heart when the episode itself is, that's kind of what the episode is lacking for me. It doesn't have that. It doesn't have like a heart or, or it doesn't have the substance that would make me really interested and in, in invested in the characters. And I think that's part of the problem with this episode is that it's, it's more silly and comedic than it is with anything, you know, 
of substance. And that, that was my main stumbling block with it. It's not because there wasn't an opportunity for it. I mean, there's plenty of situations or plenty of ways that this episode could have expanded upon the story it was telling. They could have given McGarry a deeper story arc. They could have given Stillman more of a conflict with his, with his sciencing stuff. And they could have made Casey more of a conflicted character if they wanted to go that route as well. But they didn't really do any of that. And what we're left with is this somewhat, too silly episode that doesn't have the substance to really make you that emotionally invested in it. At least that's my, that's my take on it. So if you have a different take on it, please, you know, shoot me an email and let me know what it, uh, what it is about it that you connected with so much, because as for me, it just didn't really connect with me in any meaningful way. And that's a shame because like I said, I like the baseball setting. I I would have liked to see, (sighs) I would have liked to see the Twilight Zone hit a home run with this episode, but unfortunately it's not that great. Okay, so before we move on to this week's bonus review, here's a highlight from episode 181 of The Obsessive Viewer, a weekly movie and TV podcast that I host over at obsessiveviewer.com. I immediately thought, like, holy crap, that's that's big, that's crazy. Um, and then again, it just kind of gets... Flush by the wayside, it kind of kind of doesn't really have much going on with it. Um, it's not a big through line through the season. It's it's just kind of bizarre. The whole the whole show is kind of bizarre to me. You can find the Obsessive Viewer on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, Google Play, and at obsessiveviewer.com. And you can find the episode you just heard a clip from at obsessiveviewer.com/slash ov181. Okay, so this week's bonus review is the comedian. This was an episode of Playhouse 90 written by uh, Rod Serling based on a novel by Ernest Lehman. And this was actually directed by John Frankenheimer. And I'm going to go ahead and read a quick plot description. And by the way, this entire episode of Playhouse 90, it's a hundred or not a hundred, but um, an hour and 12 minutes long. It was, uh, it's available in its entirety on YouTube. I will put a link in the show notes of this episode for that. All right, and the plot description, according to IMDb, is as follows. Sammy Hogarth, a vaudeville comedian who now has his own TV show, is a ruthless egomaniac who demands instant obedience from his staff and heaps abuse on those in lesser positions than his. His most vituperative behavior, however, is reserved for his weak-willed brother Lester, whom Sammy has hired as as his assistant, but whom he really uses as his whipping boy. And this episode won an Emmy in 1958 for best teleplay writing for uh, one hour or more. And this episode starred uh, Mickey Rooney, Edmund O'Brien, Kim Hunter, Mel Torme, and Constance Ford. Okay, so this episode starts with uh, Sammy Hogarth after after a performance, essentially berating the cast and crew because they, quote, uh, at least the cast, quote, walked through it like zombies. And he is just berating everyone. He's signaling, signaling out performers, writers, the crew, everyone involved. He's just a very unhappy person. So we immediately get just a bunch of information about Sammy or a bunch of character stuff about Sammy and that he's very angry and he is just not a very pleasant person to work with and no one gets, you know, no one gets preferential treatment or anything. And Lester, his kind of sheepish brother or his kind of shy and and quiet brother is gets, gets the brunt, the brunt of the abuse. He's, he's not someone that uh, Sammy prioritizes in his life. Uh, Sammy's needs are at the front forefront of his, of his character. And, um, Sammy just puts his needs above Lester's and everyone else in his life. So that's kind of the introduction of the episode. And I have to, I have to mention that John Frankenheimer, his camera work in this episode was, I don't know. It was a little dodgy. There's a lot, there are a lot of really tight shots that are, that follow cameras around or follow characters around the scene. And it moves around characters in these very tight close-ups that's a little distracting and a little disorienting. And I don't know, it just didn't work for me. But I also, I should add a caveat to that and say that I, I wonder if the YouTube uploader, whoever uploaded this video, 
I wonder if they put like a stabilizer effect on it because it's possible that that was that this isn't the actual depiction of of what it was like when it aired back in uh, fifty seven. And so there's a lot about the writing of this or the writers in this world in this episode. Um, Sammy kind of berates the head writer after that. So we get kind of I mean it's not necessarily repetitive, but it's not. It's not a one shot of, oh, after this performance, he hates everyone or is yelling at everyone. We get a separate scene of him berating the head writer of the show. And there's a little bit of a sense of entitlement to the character in that scene because he's, you know, he he is uh, demanding perfection from the writers because it makes him look good. And he says at one point, he says, I'll give you time uh, because the head writer asks for more time to, you know, put out, you know, a quality script. And he says, I'll give you time. I'll give you five hours. And if you can't do it, then I'll give you two weeks. And then he pauses and he says, notice. And Mickey Rooney is, is a powerhouse in this episode. He is, he is freaking amazing. His energy is just ridiculously good. He is like, he has highs and lows throughout, throughout the episode. He is, he brings so much energy to the role and he's so fantastic and, and, his character is so manic and it's firing on all cylinders that um, Mickey Rooney's depiction of anger of anger in the character and the character's hubris, it makes him detestable. But there are moments where he's candid about uh, the weight of his job and um, how much is on his shoulders every night to perform that it gives the character a lot more com- uh, complexity than what I think a lesser actor would have given to it because Mickey Rooney is just fantastic. Like, without that complexity, he'd be a cartoon character or a cartoon villain. And it's it's something that's really that really works well. This is a really great performance by Mickey Rooney. And there's a dynamic, or there's a shift in the dynamic, or not shift in the dynamic, but there's the dynamic at play here is that Lester is the antithesis of Sammy and uh, Lester is a lot less, a lot quieter and a lot smaller of a character than compared to Sammy because Sammy is more front and center. He's more attention driven. He's more uh, angry and uh, open about his feelings or negative feelings as it were. So there's a fine juxtaposition between the character of Lester and the character of Sammy in this episode. And there's a lot kind of there uh, between the characters or between both of the characters' struggles. And I won't go into much detail about about the plot or the characters in case you want to see it because I want to keep this spoiler free. But there's some interesting reveals um, about some of the characters that shift the dynamic a little bit or gives gives more weight to the relationships between the characters there that I didn't quite expect and I I was pretty well invested in. And there's a whole subplot involving or kind of the main plot of the story really involving scripts and um where they originate from. And this element of the story really brings attention to the story and and a more dramatic arc and dramatic tension to the story that I really appreciated. And to kind of close out my review of this is that it kind of, it kind of reaches a point where, um, toward the end, there's, there's this really nice element to it that the episode begins, the story itself begins immediately after a performance of the, uh, Samuel Hogarth variety show or whatever it is. um, like the opening scene is immediately after a performance. So we never actually see Sammy perform until the end of the episode where he's performing the, uh, episode that we've spent the entire, uh, the entire runtime, um, building toward and seeing the behind the scenes drama unfold surrounding it. And I like that the episode starts with the end of one performance and ends with a montage of, of his performing and it's it's an interesting juxtaposition between the character of Sammy's onstage performance and onstage persona versus his backstage scenes because he is a very angry and complex character. But when he's on stage and he's performing, the audience loves him and eats up every minute of it. And it's it's really kind of poignant. And um by the end, it, it has kind of a somber ending or kind of an interesting ending that I didn't quite expect. 
even though they kind of go some go some avenues that I feel like could have been more dramatic, but but the way it ended was was still unexpected and interesting. Um, but I just like the way it's put together that we we never see him perform until toward the end. So I appreciated that, and um, that's really all I'll say about it. In case you want to check it out, like I said, it's on YouTube in its entirety. I'll put a link in the show notes, and of course, the show notes will be at anthologypod.com dot com slash zero three zero. And um, let's see. Yeah, that's about it. That that'll do it. Um, next week is the season finale of, uh, of the twilight zone. I'm going to be covering episode 36 from, uh, the twilight zones first season, uh, a world of his own written by Richard Matheson and the original uh, directed by Ralph Nelson, I should say. And the original plan was to have the bonus review for that episode be Requiem for a heavyweight, the 1962 film based on Rod Serling's, uh, teleplay from playhouse 90 that I reviewed earlier in the season. But, um, I kind of switched that up a little bit at the last possible minute. So instead, since A World of His Own is a Richard Matheson episode, I'm going to be reviewing um, the 1980 Christopher Reeve, uh, Jane Seymour movie, Somewhere in Time, instead of Requiem for a Heavyweight. Um, so yeah, so look for that next week on the podcast. I'm also still doing my, um, closing in on the end, actually, of my bonus review series of black mirror. I'm now really deep into the, into season three and I really hope you guys are checking that out um, because I'm really proud of the reviews that I'm having and a lot of uh, it's a, it's a really great show that I want to have conversations about. So check those out on the feed. And uh, like I said, last time um, we're closing in on the end of season one and I'm wanting to get some feedback from the listeners about um, how they feel about season one of the twilight zone. And I asked for emails. So this time around, uh, this week I actually set up a page on the website to make it easier. It's just a form that you fill out. If you go to anthologypod.com slash survey, which I'll put a link to the link to it in the show notes. And there's a link on the Facebook page as well. Um, it's just a form. All you got to do is pick your favorite episode, least favorite episode of season one, give some information about it really quick, hit submit, sends right to me. Um, I'm going to have my, I'm going to have my season one review up in a couple weeks. So you still have a little bit of time, but go ahead and do that now. It's at anthologypod.com slash survey. I'm asking for people's thoughts on season one overall, their favorite moments, favorite endings, um, favorite episodes, along with their least favorite moments, endings, and episodes. Um, and all that's for episode 32 of the podcast. So having said all that, thank you guys so much for listening and don't forget to rate and review on iTunes and um, I'll see you guys next week. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to Anthology presented by ObsessiveViewer.com. You can find more episodes at AnthologyPod.com and you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or your preferred podcast app. If you'd like to help support the podcast, please take a few minutes to leave a rating and a review on iTunes. The more reviews I get, the higher the show will be ranked in iTunes search results, making it easier for people to discover it and grow the podcast. Of course, you can always email me your thoughts and feelings about the show to matt at obsessiveviewer.com. You can also tweet me at obsessiveviewer like the Facebook page at facebook.com slash anthologypod, or you can call and leave me a voicemail at 317-762-6099 for a chance to have it played on the show. If you like what you've heard here, I urge you to check out The Obsessive Viewer, a weekly movie and TV podcast I host with my friends Mike and Tiny. Also check out The Obsessive Viewer blog at obsessiveviewer.com where I write movie reviews, TV reviews, and the occasional editorial about the business of entertainment. If you want even more obsessive content in your life, subscribe to the Obsessive Viewer subreddit at r slash obsessive viewer and check out obsessivebooknerd.com, our sister site for book reviews, author spotlights, and a general celebration of reading. Finally, if you're philosophically curious check out my friend Tiny's side project podcast, The Secular Perspective, which explores the concepts of faith, religion, and existence from the perspective of secular hosts. You can find that at thesecularperspective.com. Once again, thank you very much for listening, and I'll see you next time.